Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vas Adi Gaur Bhaktivinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Ram Ram Hare Hare It's time for Krishna book and this is part four of the volume two chapter 32 which is a fairly long chapter and it is the prayers of the Vedas personified and I believe it's one of the Kumaras I think Sanatana Kumara who's speaking that his absorption and realizations of, of the Vedas so perfect in devotion it, when he speaks it's the Vedas personified so I believe this is him speaking and so the chapter is called the Vedas personified of course uh, spiritual master as the pure representative of Srila Vyasadeva is the person Bhagavat Pure devotee is the person Bhagavat, and the book Bhagavat, the Vedas, of the book Bhagavat, and then the pure representative of the Vedic conclusions, the devotional conclusions, is the personified Vedas. So this is, I understand, it's another, another way to understand the pure devotee, spiritual master, and there is a line of pure disciplic succession coming from the Kumaras, great saintly souls, the Kumaras, sons of Lord Brahma. And there is a disciplic succession coming directly from Lord Brahma also. So this is the prayers of the Vedas personified. And we'll continue on with part four here. As translated and presented in a story like a story, by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, founder Acharya of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. In the beginning of life, every living entity is food conscious. A child or an animal is satisfied only by getting nice food. The stage of consciousness in which the goal is to eat sumptuously is called Anamaya. Ana means food. After this, one lives in the consciousness of being alive. If one can continue his life without being attacked or destroyed, one thinks himself happy. And this stage is called pranamaya, or consciousness of one's existence. After this stage, when one is situated on the mental platform, that consciousness is called manomaya. Material civilization is primarily situated in these three stages, Anamaya, Pranamaya, and Manamaya. The first concern of civilized persons is economic development, and the next concern is defense against being annihilated, and the next consciousness is mental speculation, the philosophical approach to the values of life. If by the evolutionary process of philosophical life, one happens to reach the platform of intellectual life and understands he's not this material body, but is spirit, soul. Then by evolution of spiritual life, he comes to the understanding of the Supreme Lord or the Supreme Soul. When one develops his relationship with him and executes devotional service, that stage of life is called Krishna consciousness, the Anandamaya stage. Anandamaya is the blissful life of knowledge and eternity. As it is stated in Vedanta Sutra, Anandamaya Vyasat, the Supreme Brahman and the subordinate Brahman or the Supreme Personality of Godhead and living entities are both joyful by nature. As long as the living entities are situated in the lower four stages of life, 
Anamaya, Pranamaya, Manamaya, and Vigyanamaya, they're considered to be in the material condition of life. But as soon as one reaches the stage of Anandamaya, he becomes a liberated soul. This Anandamaya stage is explained in Bhagavad Gita as the Brahmabhuta stage. And there it is said that in the Brahmabhuta stage of life, there's no anxiety, no hankering. The stage begins when one becomes equally disposed toward all living entities, and it then expands to the stage of Krishna consciousness in which one always hankers to render service unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead. This hankering for advancement in devotional service is not the same as hankering for sense gratification in material existence. In other words, hankering remains in spiritual life, but it becomes purified. When our senses are purified, they become free from all material stages, namely Anamaya, Pranamaya, Manamaya, and Vigyanamaya, and they become situated in the highest stage, Anandamaya, or blissful life in Krishna consciousness. The Mayavadi philosophers consider Anandamaya to be the state of being merged in the Supreme. To them, Anandamaya means that the super soul and individual soul become one. But the real fact is that oneness does not mean merging into the Supreme and losing one's own individual existence. Merging in the spiritual existence is the living entity's realization of qualitative oneness with the Supreme Lord in his eternity and knowledge aspects. But the actual Anandamaya blissful stage is obtained when one is engaged in devotional service. That's confirmed in Bhagavad Gita. Mad Bhaktim Labhate Param. The Brahma Bhutta Anandamaya stage is complete only when there is the exchange of love between the Supreme and the subordinate living entities. Unless one comes to this Anandamaya stage of life, his breathing is like the breathing of a bellows in a blacksmith's shop, his duration of life is like that of a tree, and he's no better than the lower animals like camels, hogs, and dogs. Undoubtedly, the eternal living entity cannot be annihilated at any point. But the lower species of life exist in a miserable condition, whereas one who is engaged in devotional service of the Supreme Lord, situated in the pleasurable or anandamaya status of life. The different stages described above are all in relation with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Although in all circumstances they exist, both the Supreme Personality of Godhead and the living entities, the difference is the Supreme Personality of Godhead always exists in the Anandamaya stage, whereas the subordinate living entities, because of their minute position as fragmental portions of the Supreme Lord, are prone to fall to the other stages of life. Although in all the stages both the Supreme Lord and the living entities exist, the Supreme Personality of Godhead is always transcendental to our concept of life, whether we are in bondage or in liberation. The whole cosmic manifestation becomes possible by the grace of the Supreme Lord. It exists by the grace of the Supreme Lord, and when it is annihilated, it merges into the existence of the Supreme Lord. As such, the Supreme Lord is the supreme existence, the cause of all causes. Therefore, the conclusion is that without development of Krishna consciousness, one's life is simply a waste of time. Those who are very materialistic and cannot understand the situation of the spiritual world cannot understand the abode of Krishna. For such persons, great sages have recommended the yoga process whereby one gradually rises from meditation on the abdomen, which is called muladhar or manipuraka meditation. Muladhar and manipuraka are technical terms which refers 
to the intestines within the abdomen. Grossly materialistic persons think that economic development is of the foremost importance because they're under the impression a living entity exists only by eating. Such grossly materialistic persons forget that although we may eat as much as we like, if the food is not digested, it produces the troubles of indigestion, acidity. Therefore, in itself, eating is not the cause of the vital energy of life. For digestion of edibles, we have to take shelter of another superior energy, which is mentioned in Bhagavad Gita as Vaishvanara. Lord Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that he helps the digestion in the form of Vaishvanara. Supreme Personality of God, it is all pervasive. Therefore, his presence as Vaishvanara is not extraordinary. Krishna is actually present everywhere. The Vaishnava, therefore, marks his body with temples of Vishnu. He first marks the Tilak temple on the abdomen, then on the chest, then between the collarbones, then on the forehead, and gradually he marks the top of the head, the Brahma Rundra. The 13 temples of Tilak marked on the body of a Vaishnava are known as follows. On the forehead is the temple Lord Keshava. On the belly is the temple of Lord Narayana. On the chest is the temple of Lord Madhava. And on the throat, between the two collarbones, is the temple of Lord Govinda. On the right side of the waist is the temple of Lord Vishnu. On the right arm is the temple of Lord Madhusudana. And on the right side of the collarbone, the temple of Lord Trivikram. Similarly, on the left side of the waist is the temple of Lord Vamanadev. On the left arm is the temple of Sridhar. And on the left side of the collarbone is the temple of Rishikesh. On the upper back is the temple called Padmanabha. And on the lower back is the temple called Damodar. And on the top of the head, the temple is called Vasudev. This is the process of meditation on the Lord's situation in different parts of the body. But for those who are not Vaishnavas, great sages recommend meditation on the bodily concept of life, meditation on the intestines, on the heart, on the throat, on the eyebrows, on the forehead, and then on the top of the head. Some of the sages in the disciplic succession from the great saint Aruna meditate on the heart because the super soul is also staying within the heart along with the living entity. And this is confirmed in Bhagavad Gita, 15th chapter, wherein the Lord says, I'm situated in everyone's heart. For the Vaishnav, the protection of the body for the service of the Lord is a part of devotional service. But those who are gross materialists accept the body as the self. They worship the body by the yogic process of meditation on the different bodily parts such as Manipuraka, Dahar, and Rudaya, gradually rising to the Brahma Rundra on the top of the head. A first class yogi who has attained perfection in the practice of the yoga system ultimately passes through the Brahma Rundra to any one of the planets in either the material or spiritual worlds. How a yogi can transfer himself to another planet is very vividly described in the second canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. In this regard, Sukadeva Goswami has recommended that the beginners worship the Virata Purusha, the gigantic universal form of the Lord one who cannot believe that the Lord can be worshipped with equal success in the deity or archer form, or who cannot concentrate on this form, is advised to worship the universal form of the Lord. The lower part of the universe is considered the feet and legs of the Lord's universal form, and the middle part of the universe is considered the navel or abdomen of the Lord. The upper planetary systems, such as Janaloka, Mahaloka are the heart of the Lord, and the topmost planetary system, Brahmaloka, is considered the top of the Lord's head. 
There are different processes recommended by the great sages according to the position of the worshipper. But the ultimate aim of all meditational and yogic processes is to go back home, back to Godhead. As stated in Bhagavad Gita, anyone who reaches the highest planet, the abode of Krishna, or even the Vaikuntha planets, never has to come back down again to this miserable material condition of life. The Vedic recommendation, therefore, is that one make the lotus feet of Vishnu the target of all one's efforts. Tad Vishnu Paramam Padam Vishnu Loka or the Vishnu planets are situated above all the material planets. These Vaikuntha planets are known as Sanatana Dham and they are eternal. They're never annihilated, not even by the annihilation of this material world. Conclusion is, if a person, if a human being does not fulfill the mission of his life by worshiping the Supreme Lord and does not go back to Godhead, it's be understood that he has been frustrated in fulfilling the main purpose of human life. The next prayer of the personified Vedas to the Lord concerns his entering into different species of life. It is stated in Bhagavad Gita, 14th chapter, that in every species and form of life, the spiritual part and parcel of the Supreme Lord is present. The Lord himself claims in the Gita that he is the seed-giving father of all forms and species, and therefore they must all be considered sons of the Lord. The entrance of the Supreme Lord into everyone's heart as Paramatma sometimes bewilders the impersonalists who think in terms of the equality of the living entities with the Supreme Lord. They think that because the Supreme Lord enters into different bodies along with the individual soul, there's no distinction between the Lord and the individual entities. Their challenge is, why should individual souls worship the Paramatma or Supersoul? According to them, both the Supersoul and the individual soul are on the same level. They are one, without any difference between them. There is a difference, however, between the Supersoul and the individual soul. And this is explained in Bhagavad Gita, 15th chapter, wherein the Lord says that although he is situated with the living entity in the same body, he's superior. He is dictating to or giving intelligence to the individual soul from within. It's clearly stated in the Gita that the Lord gives intelligence to the individual soul and that both memory and forgetfulness are due to the influence of the Supersoul. No one can act independently of the sanction of a Supersoul. Therefore, the individual soul acts according to his past karma, reminded by the Lord. The nature of the individual soul is forgetfulness, but the presence of the Lord within the heart reminds him of what he wanted to do in the past life. The intelligence of the individual soul is exhibited like fire in wood. Although fire is always fire, it is exhibited in a size proportionate to the size of the wood. Similarly, although the individual soul is qualitatively one with the Supreme Lord, he exhibits himself according to the limitations of his present body. Supreme Lord, or the Super Soul, is said to be Eka Ras. Eka means one, Ras means mellow. The transcendental position of the Supreme Lord is that of eternity, bliss, and full knowledge. His position of Eka Ras does not change in the slightest when he becomes a witness and advisor to the individual soul in each individual body. And it's late tonight, so we'll just read a little bit. Hare Krishna. <laughs>